This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders, from ship to shore, air to ground. Cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov slash careers. your host, Andrew Donaldson. This is Heard Tell. Yeah, it's Heard Tell Show. It is Wednesday. It's February the 23rd. So glad you're with us. I'm Andrew Donaldson. A lot to cover today. Going to jump right into it. Uh, Pavel Fitzner is going to join us. We're going to talk a little bit about Russia, Ukraine, Vladimir Putin. Also, our buddy Brian O'Nolan has written in Ordinary Dash Times about the idea of putting cameras in the classroom in addition to being a great writer. He is also a teacher, so we're going to get into that story with him. Uh, the Ahmad Aubrey case, we have been, been following that. We've been covering it here on Hertel, been writing about it over at Ordinary-Times.com. The civil rights trial, the hate crimes trial is in, the verdict is in. We're going to cover that and why we got here, how we got here. Also, a civil rights icon and martyr uh, that you may not know about, directly related. He was a VMI graduate, Virginia Military Institute. And his death led directly to the opening of that institution, the last state sponsored institution in the state of Virginia to be desegregated. We will get into that story, but let's start back with Russia. I know we've been talking about it a lot. We've been talking about it from the Russia Ukraine principle. We've been talking about it from the point of view of overseas. We've been talking about it in the point of view of geopolitics. But I want to take a minute to talk about it from the American perspective. And I hate to do it. But I've just got to be honest, we know how this story is going to play out in American media, regardless of what happens in Ukraine. Within a couple of weeks, maybe a month, maybe sooner, America is going to move on from it and forget about it. We know this because think for a minute what happened in Afghanistan. It was hot in the headlines. Within two or three weeks after it, most of the media and most of America had moved on, even though people like us here at Hertel continue to talk about it. What happened the last time Ukraine was invaded by Russia? The Crimean Peninsula. That wasn't that long ago. It was only 2014. And yet you almost never hear about it. Most people, it was new information when Russia did their invasion and all that they're doing now. For that matter, when Russia went into Georgia years ago, still not that long ago, but hardly a blip on the radar screen. And most people don't know to apply that to the situation now. My point is, we in America have a very short attention span when it comes to foreign policy problems. For goodness sakes, we just fought a war in Afghanistan for 20 years, and unless there was a major casualty incident, it never hardly broke through in the headlines other than in policy circles and politics. 20 years. We barely paid attention to it, even though we had our own people involved, or even worse when it comes to other countries. Now, there are isolationists among us who say that's a great thing. We should ignore the rest of the world. We should just not have anything to do with the global system. Well, that's childish frankly, the world is globally integrated. All those products you like to buy on the cheap, you're globally integrated. All that technology in the palm of your hand and your phone, you're globally integrated. Get over it. Part of the responsibility of being America means when you are the greatest and most powerful nation on earth, you have a responsibility to pay attention to what's going on in the earth. But we know how this is going to go in Ukraine because we do this over and over again. And we already know some of what might knock it out of the headlines, although something might surprise us. Here in a couple weeks, President Biden is going to issue his Supreme Court nominee, and we're going to all fight about that the same way we've been fighting about other things online. We have all this technology and power in our hand, 
And we've advocated before, and it's somewhat of a joke, but there's truth in it, that we should do more with it than just yell at Washington and share cat pictures with it. We can be a force for good. You can be a voice for the voiceless. You can reach out to people who otherwise are isolated or don't have social circles in real life. They can build them online. When it comes to things like Ukraine, we can speak, those of us in the West that have freedom of speech, we can shout down things like Russian propaganda. We can speak the truth about what's going on. But what normally happens is we miss the key ingredient to actually doing something productive with all this technology and with all our freedoms and with every advantage that we have. No, it's not a policy. It's not censorship. It's not even something like government oppressing us. It's a whole lot of lack of give a damn. We just don't want to care about other people's problems in the way that we probably should. It's sad to say, but we know how the Ukraine story is going to play out in America. In a couple of weeks, if not sooner, we'll get bored with it and we'll turn our attention back inwardly. And those poor people will just have to fend for themselves with America not paying attention. Foreign policy depends on cohesion and consistency. Vladimir Putin's had a consistent policy and plan for years. We can't even be bothered to pay attention for a couple of weeks. You want to know how the world order falls to bad actors like Russia, like Putin, like Xi Jinping, like China? Start with your own phone. Start with a mirror. Look at yourself. Can you be made to pay attention to something outside of the news cycle, outside of what your friends are sharing in cat pictures? outside of things that affect you and make you feel good and tickle your ears and your media? Can you pay attention to the problems of the world and do something productive about it on your social media? Or are you just going to share cat pictures? And to hell with those poor people in Ukraine who have tanks rolling up on them. It's all on us, folks. We get the world we deserve to live in. And the height of privilege, somebody once said, is getting to pick what your problems are. And too often lately, America is acting very privileged indeed to the detriment of the rest of the world. More Heard Tell right after this. Uh, welcome back to Heard Tell. Uh, our buddy Brian O'Nolan has been on this program multiple times, is also, in addition to being an excellent writer, a teacher. And he has been writing in Ordinary-Times.com, a piece that you can read right now uh, concerning proposals to place cameras in the classroom. And I want to read an excerpt from that piece. It's excellent. We're also going to try to get Brian on the program to talk about this topic. But a lot of people have started to come up with the idea because they don't like certain curriculum points. We've talked about the CRT debate. We've talked about other things going on in the school system. So there's some folks that are now saying, well, why don't we just put cameras in the classrooms? Uh, That's an idea that I'm against. But I'll set my part aside for a minute. I will defer to Brian, and let's check out Brian's piece about what he says about This is from Ordinary-Times.com. Brian O'Nolan, make sure you're following him. Quoting, all of this is to say that some folks of what calls itself the political right have opined that putting cameras in school classrooms is a worthy objective. Such a proposition is absurd, backwards, counterproductive, and just the sort of thing the very proponents would decry as nigh communism or proposed by their political enemies. It's dumb. While I would say that as a teacher, I'm not the only or even the most important party to be affected. Such a camera and school classrooms policy is both unworkable and bad for the kids. Most years I have had at least one student who, for one reason or another, cannot be photographed. Sometimes it is simply that the parents would prefer not to have a kid appear in the picture. More often, it is a question of there being some ramification for the child of someone, an errant non-custodial parent, let's say, or to find out where the student goes to school. If there's a camera in the classroom, everyone that tracks the teachers around the room, there's a high likelihood that such a student's privacy is going to get violated. Formal privacy aside, I can see a host of problems arising around the visible activities of students appearing on such a camera. Student behavior can easily be taken out of context. There are definitely times when I, as a teacher, choose to ignore a behavior for one reason or another. Sometimes intervention is not worth the effort or may even be counterproductive. I know the kid knows he messed up when he swore under his breath and he had a rough day already, say. At other times, the behavior may be more appropriately addressed at another time. Just today, I decided not to punish a cell phone violation in class because I knew the student to be near the breaking point with anxiety 
over an upcoming presentation that I let it go and merely mentioned to her afterwards that I saw it and would prefer it not happen again. That's the correspondent she was responding to was of her mother. The school board member is a separate issue entirely. I feel like an idiot pointing out the sky is blue in 2022 by writing the following clause, but context is important, especially when the times we are in. Again, this is Brian O'Nolan writing in ordinary-times.com about cameras in the classroom. If cameras enter the classroom and are publicly viewable, I guarantee you, you will have YouTube channels featuring attractive teachers and unanticipated and unwelcoming compromising videos. And that's just the adults. Remember, there are sickos among us. On a less disgusting and still troubling note, cameras in the classroom would have a direct and immediate effect on the quality of teaching and not in a good way. Imagine your every move, word, and decision analyzed and second-guessed by Big Brother. In this case, potentially that mom on Facebook who complains vehemently about absolutely everything, never with more than a third of the real facts and with the only objectionable, obs- with the only objective of having her senseless caterwauling validated. There was a parent on the town Facebook page recently who said something to the effect of, quote, I guess it's time to clear them all out. This is a troubling notion for several reasons. Firstly, teachers are already leaving the profession in droves. We don't need a medal or a statue, and many have had it worse over the last two years, but teaching has been a particularly thankless and high-stress vocation during the pandemic. The burnout is real and will impact student learning, and not in a good way. Second, the notion that as a clean sweep, not literally, of course, is beneficial, fails to even consider what those teachers are going to be replaced with. Other teachers. The other teachers would be increasingly younger and less experienced and perhaps less prepared. On a personal note, cameras in school classrooms in, Brian out. I don't get paid enough to deal with Big Brother watching my every move. If you want to Monday morning quarterback me, start paying me a quarterback salary. I'm not opposed to observation or accountability, far from it. Should parents know what curricula and materials their children are being exposed to? Should parents have a say in that curricula? Yes and yes, absolutely. But those who rail against teachers are often conflating the embarrassing behavior of teachers in big city districts or at home, Virginia or California, again, this is Brian O'Nolan writing, with those of their local schools. In many places, your child's teachers are your neighbors. They shop where you do, pay the same inflated prices you do, deal with many of the same frustrations as you do. They neither, as students seem to believe, blink out of existence at the closing bell. I saw my teacher at Walmart, funniness, nor monolithically vote the way you think they do. Parents should absolutely be informed, nay, very well informed, on what their children are being taught and what materials are used in that teaching. Parents should have a say in those decisions. Parents should have an active role in not only advocating for their child, but in ensuring that the school culture is one that benefits each and every child. I agree wholeheartedly as a parent and a teacher. That said, if you want a positive outcome for you and other kids in the classroom, adding cameras to the school classroom, to those environments, is not the answer. That's Brian O'Nolan, talented writer, a friend of the program who's been on before. We will have him again. He's also a teacher writing about the cameras in the classroom, hollering, some folks online are demanding. And I would point out this as well. The only reason they're hollering about that is for something that they don't like. I guarantee you, if you actually did cameras in the classroom and videoed their child, they would find a lot more that they don't like that way as well. Better off, leave the classroom to the teachers, hold them accountable, be involved in what's going on. But remember what we always advocate on this program. Part of the problem and the breakdown in the education system right now is that it's become teachers versus parents versus students versus the administration level of the school. Those things all need to work in a partnership, especially the parent-teacher-student partnership, which is the core of education, especially a public education system. Nobody seems to want to work on that problem. Putting cameras in the classroom, putting more layers on top of an already complicated relationship, that's not going to help anything. We need to repair the partnership between parents and students and teachers first and foremost if we're going to have any kind of a quality education system. And half-cocked, half-brained silliness that sounds great on social media but would be an absolute nightmare in practical application isn't going to help anything. More Herd Tell right after this.
Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. Uh, let's go back overseas. Uh, Australia down under. Morning for me, evening for him. That's the way these things work. Uh, Pavel Feisner, a uh, Young Voices contributor down in Australia. Good morning, sir. How are you? I'm great, thanks. Uh, great to be on with you, Andrew. Hey, appreciate your time, sir. Okay, so we scheduled this because we were going to talk about Russia and Ukraine, and then while we were waiting, things that we were kind of waiting on sort of kicked off, so I'll just give you the floor. Where do you want to start with it? We had uh, Vladimir Putin's speech yesterday. He is going to recognize the two regions of Ukraine. Uh, this is uh, annexation. This is sort of the Georgian Crimean model that we have seen before. How do you want to start with this one? Uh, well, uh, I guess it is, uh, it's, it's really uh, interesting uh, to see how quickly the situation can change. Um, you know, again, I, I wrote an article about uh, uh, 22 days ago or uh, er, earlier this month, and um, the, the situation's completely changed. Um, you know, we, we've, from, we've got reports that uh, there's now troops in um, eastern Ukraine in the um, breakaway uh, regions of the Donetsk and Luhansk. Um, and I, I think um, Putin is now making his move. Um, he, he's got the stage set. He's, he's getting those uh, provocation, the, the, you know, the fake um, provocations for war. And I, I think now um, he, he's ready to go if he wants to invade um, properly. Yeah, he's using the guise of peacekeepers. We've seen this, you know, this is a very old tactic. This is nothing new. Um, we, we know the history here. Uh, we know the Ukraine was part of not only the old Soviet Union, but the old Russian Empire. Um, I know I get into the trap. I think Soviet Union, really what Putin's after is the old Soviet Empire that even predates that, something the czars would recognize. This is a lot of back history, even though this is moving uh, pieces that are more recent. How much of the history do you think plays into this? Because we, I know, especially in America, we tend to have short views on things because we're a young country. Australia is a young country in a lot of ways, but y'all are on the other side of the world. What's the perspective of the history part of this? Because I don't think we discussed this enough, and I think it skews our viewpoint on this. Yeah, look, I, I think the history is a really, really important part um, of why this is all happening. Um, it, it, look, there's obviously um, you know the, the NATO issue and and Russia wanting to to um, you know push its sphere of influence out, but you got to recognise that um, Ukraine um, and Kiev particularly um, it, it is really a founding founding um, territory um, for Russia. They, they had the Kievan Rus in the 900s. They were that was the real uh, the, the first real uh, unified Russia. Uh, before that, it was, it was a bunch of principalities. And so there's always been a very, very strong tie between Kiev and the Ukrainian region as, as with the rest of um, Western Russia. Um, and uh, there's obviously deep cultural and ethnic connection there. And a lot of Russians um, know their history and they know that, you know, that is where um, Russia was born, um, you know, with uh, through the you know the the multiple principalities merging um, with you know Ukraine and um, the the Western Russian principalities, um, so I, I think there is obviously a lot of patriotism uh, for the Russian people, and, and they would like to see their you know history renew itself. Um, but again, there there are also geopolitical reasons behind Putin's actions. Yeah, we'll get back to that patriotism in a minute, because I think I think we think Putin's talking to us and I don't think he is. I think everything he's doing is talking internally right now. What's the impression on your side of the world, though? Because we kind of get European centered and focused. But some of our other Aussie friends were pointing out to me that uh, for folks on your side of the world, you kind of look at this a little differently because, um, of course, Australia has the famous quad. You're thinking, well, this this could involve India. This can involve China. This could get really ugly. Uh, secondarily for your side of the world. Talk about that viewpoint of it, because that's something we're not hearing here because we're so focused on the European part of it. This re does reorder you know, NATO and the Western order. This has a lot of potential to mess up a lot of the things like India, like Pakistan, like a lot of other moving parts that maybe affect your side of the world a little bit more. Yeah. Um, I don't necessarily think, um, you know, th this is going to be World War Three with, you know, us versus China and, you know, Ukrainians, well, the Ukrainians obviously will be fighting the Russians, but, you know, the Americans getting involved against um, Russia. But if, if I were to play that side of the argument, um, 
it is a great opportunity for Xi Jinping and the the Taiwan Taiwan um, situation. So they are it, it's it's a very um, analogous situation between you know um, Eastern Ukraine or Ukraine and, and Russia, as with uh, Taiwan and mainland China. And I think um, I, I think the Western leaders. Uh, and the way you know the UN and democracy works in the West is, is rather slow and not really good at responding to immediate threats. And if the entire world is focused on what's happening right now in Ukraine, I think um, it will not only set a precedent for um, for Xi Jinping and China to potentially um, you know cause some issues with Taiwan. Look at you know provoking provoking them, you know, trying to start an invasion perhaps. Um, and if, if they can move fast enough, um, you know, if the West was totally distracted on on um, Ukraine you know, and they could pull something off very fast, you know, both countries might have got what they want without this blowing up into uh, World War Three. Yeah, talking to Pavel Fazer. Um, here's the thing. we we I think you make the excellent point here is that when you have kind of the two, let's just call them the largest uh, bad actors on the stage in Russia and China, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, um, the perception, apparently accurate, is that the West is weak. The rest of the world is fractured. They are not united. Even then, their response to this, it's been kind of scattershot because you have Manuel Macron kind of doing his own thing, trying to trying to play peacemaker. Joe Biden's doing everything by phone calls. Uh, Boris Johnson's got problems at home, so he's not exactly been consistent in what he says is the sense of the world that there's just not a lot to stop these large powers that are dictatorial powers because the rest of the world just cannot get their stuff together to have a united front about it. I, I think that's a fairly accurate assumption. I, I, I think the, the West likes to pretend that it is united, but we've got a whole lot of issues, not only internally within our own countries, but also amongst ourselves. You know, there's a lot of conflict within the EU, post-Brexit, other, other you know, more Eastern European countries within the EU are looking at moving out of it. And, you know, you, you can fake a, a united front against Russia, but when it comes down to it, are they really, is everyone really ready to act? Is everyone really ready to stand up and fight against Russia? And, and that's where I have my doubts. Pavel Fitzner joining us. Uh, when you wrote about it, you talked about that weakness uh, you expressed. And th this is a, of course, the situation has changed in the three weeks since you wrote about this, but still the, the point remains. You talked about the domestic weakness of these countries coming off the COVID stuff, coming off uh, political fractured stuff that, you know, an actual military campaign probably isn't in the cards for anybody in the West right now. At the same time, though, what should we be doing? I know people talk about sanctions, but they can't even seem to get on the same page as to what exactly the sanctions would be. We've already had the the mess with uh, President Biden basically handing back Nordstrom too, so that would have been a big chip that's kind of already been taken off the board. What exactly can they do sanction-wise since we all kind of agree that there's not going to be a military solution here other than maybe arming the Ukrainians more than they are? Yeah. Uh, well, in terms of sanctions, I don't think they're going to be rather uh, that, that effective against Russia either. Russia's dealt with sanctions before. Um, they know what to expect and they have quite a uh, self-reliant economy. Um, they can produce enough food and, uh, you know, machinery and all the things that most countries have to import um, themselves. Yeah, they've obviously got a lot of uh, natural resources, gas, oil. And here's the problem. Uh, at, at the moment, the European Union is quite dependent on Russian gas. Um, and it, and, and um, over the last couple of months, gas prices have shot up um, in Europe, um, especially for the past winter. And if, if Russia decides to turn off the tap, um, turn off the gas to, um, to Europe, there could be really big problems um, for, for Europe and their standard of living, you know, there'll be um, gas shortages, people go cold. So, yes, the West can put sanctions on Russia, but Russia can cause a lot of harm to Europe as well. Yeah, they're in a rock and a hard place. Talking to Pavel Fitzner, uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go back into Russia. We're going to talk about Vladimir Putin. We're going to talk about the patriotism angle that he's playing up here. We're going to talk about those economic conditions we talked about, like the gas prices going up. It's not accidental that the gas prices are high when he makes this move. 
talking about all that with our friend Pavel Fitzner over in Australia on Hertel right after this. Uh, welcome back to Herd Tell. We're talking to Pavel Fitzner over in Australia, Young Voices contributor. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. Let's go back and dive into it a little bit. You talked about this is a very patriotic thing in Russia. We understand that when you have a dictator type leader like Vladimir Putin, there's a lot of patriotism involved, a lot of nationalism involved. I think most I think most Western media is misreading a lot of what he's doing. Because I don't think he's really taking into account things like the Munich conference. I don't think he's listening to the Western leaders at all. Almost everything he said publicly in media in the last few weeks, it seems like it's all directed solely at the Russian people themselves and his own uh, his own leaders. We had the song and dance of him and the cabinet officials in the great rotunda looking room where they're all spread out. Basically, they were all standing up pledging loyalty for lack of a better way of explaining it. Th- this whole PR campaign, for lack of a better term, this has all been internal, really, hasn't it? Well, it's definitely an internal part of it. I, I, of course, Russia does want to expand their borders and, and preserve their, um, their sphere of influence. Um, but yeah, look, Putin does want to ensure that he is, you know, re-elected over and over again. Um, now, traditionally, he has always had a very high approval rating. Um, in recent years, there's been more protests, more dissent against the government. Um, and I think if he did pull this off, um, you know, a, a lot of prestige would be given to him and a lot more support um, from the Russian people. Um, my feeling is the Russian people are pretty ambivalent about what exactly is happening. They'll support really whatever the government wants to do. Um, there, there's not much active uh, backlash against what he's doing at the moment, which tells me if they do pull it off and they do succeed, um, uh, you know, his approval rating will probably go up within Russia. What would ding it? Uh, a prolonged conflict, a bloody conflict. If there was, uh, if they did figure out some kind of combination of them getting bogged down in these regions, because uh, look, this this is a massive amount of military hardware in the field right now. It takes a lot of money and resources to sustain that. The Russian military logistics is not their strong suit. We know from history either economic sanctions or just the weight of the maneuvers of it. If this goes for a while, is that something that could really change the calculation for him at home? Yeah, absolutely. Um, If this drags out and, you know, they get, you know, dug in into trenches and it's fighting for for years and years, there's going to be a lot of problems. Um, It would be the same if the U.S. intervened and it got dragged out. The U.S. would have the same problems. Um, now, from what I understand, um, Russia is not expecting um, conscripts to fight. You know, Russia does have conscription, but they're not deploying conscript battalions to the front. They're not expecting them to fight. They don't want conscripts to die in this conflict. Um, they've got only professional soldiers really ready to invade. Um, so if they can pull off a short, sharp war, which is possible if um, Belarus, you know, let them invade from their territory. Kiev's not very far from the Belarusian border. Um, you could fit, uh, pull off a, a quick war. But I don't think um, Russia would invade if they expected the war to be dragged out. They don't want that, and it's not going to give them any bonus. Yeah, you mentioned Belarus. Uh, how big was the West not doing more against the Levachenko election when he clearly stole the election? There was an uprising. It looked like there was a moment where they could have what happened in Ukraine, where, you know, the non-Putin puppet got beaten in the election and President Zelensky came in and where we are where we are now and no small part of that. In retrospect, that election in Belarus a few years ago was a really, really big deal because now they are basically a wholly owned subsidiary of Russia. And all you look a lot of geopolitics. You can just look at the map. If you if you're going to drive into Ukraine, Belarus is to their north, and it's real close to Kiev. I don't think they're going to go into Kiev. I think they're going to stay in these regions because that would be a you know the the Ukrainians would fight them tooth and nail. You'd have women and children fighting. Then I don't think they're going to do that. But when you look at the map. How big was that Belarus election in retrospect? And that was one of those points is like, if the West was going to prevent this, that was one of the spots they probably should have done something. Yeah, well, um, Belarus, I think since about 20 years ago, has had an agreement with Russia that at some point they are going to you know, reunify or make a joint parliament um, and become 
the same country or, or have some form of union. Um, now, it's not really happened just yet, but we do know that uh, they are essentially Russia's puppet. Now, if, if the West did interfere in their election and try and uh, try to change the results, I think it'd be a huge provocation against Russia. And I think that's why the US didn't, or the US or the West didn't do it, um, because Russia sees that as their own backyard. And again, if, if, if Westerners are getting involved in Belarus, I think Russia would start stepping in there as well um, to make sure that um, what they don't want to happen doesn't happen. Uh, so I'd see quite a similar thing to the Ukraine conflict. Yeah, in that same vein, um, I don't think the West, especially America, especially the American president, I don't think this talk of moving Zelensky out of Ukraine or at least out of Kiev, I think that is extremely not helpful dialogue and rhetoric. Um, I know Zelensky has publicly now told uh, the Western leadership a couple of times of like, hey, quit talking about a constant invasion, quit talking about us abandoning the capital. I don't know that the West fully appreciates the way the way the way they're going about this publicly. I don't think they're really helping a whole lot with their rhetoric here. Is that how you see it? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what the mainstream media has been doing has been really damaging for Ukraine and, and the con the situation as a whole. That when I wrote my article, uh, things weren't so hadn't escalated so much. They you know, yes, Russia had troops on the border. But they've done this from time to time. They've done stunts like that. But the media wanted to make it seem as, you know, yes, invasion is imminent. We're going to predict the date. You know, um, it's 100% going to happen. It's going to be World War Three. And none of this was coming from U Ukrainian media. Ukrainians weren't trying to, you know, say this is World War Three. The U Ukrainians are trying to be calm about it. Um, again, the Russians weren't trying to make it seem like it was going to be World War III because they're trying to downplay their own actions. But I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think the West thought that if 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 their media goes and demonizes Russia and, and says that they're going to start World War III, that that would, for some reason, prevent prevent uh, Putin from pursuing the war. Um, that they, they think that their smears would really change his decision making. But I think as Putin has waited it out and he hasn't invaded imminently, like the uh, article was predicted, um, you know, a month ago, um, or and he didn't in, in invade on the, the US um, intelligence's predicted date, I think it's made the West look uh, quite like a fool. Um, and uh, I, I think it's, it's only played in uh, Putin's favour. Yeah, Pavel Fitzner joining us. Uh, you mentioned it this way, so it brings up the larger point to loop this back a little bit. Foreign policy is a process of uh, consistency and cohesion. The actor in this story that has had the most consistency and cohesion, even though it's it's wrong and it's invades Ukraine, has been Vladimir Putin. Is it just that simple that he's had a plan and stuck to it and nobody else seems to have one? Well, um, I, I think... Um, R Russia knew what they wanted to do from the start, um, and I think they they knew or they know if they're going to invade or if they are not going to, and they, they know known that a month ago, two months ago. Um, I, I think the West didn't predict Russia to act in the way they are. They didn't think Russia would play it out. They thought they would respond to the um, to the uh, Western um, you know diplomatic. Uh, responses and threats um, and the haphazardness of, of the West um, in their response to it uh, really not um, helped them at all. Um, so I, I think Russia definitely, well, they've got all the secrets. Um, and it is half intelligence. This war is half intelligence. Um, if, if Russia knows what they're going to do and no one else knows what they're going to do, they're going to be, you know, five steps ahead. And, and so long as they maintain um, the, the surprise um, and the deceit and all, all their little um, tricky tacks that they play on the um, intelligence, uh, the, the international intelligence stage, um, I, I think they'll come out better off. Yeah. Um, if they do what it looks like they're going to do now, what uh, Vladimir Putin is hinting at, 
Uh, they're going to go under the auspices of independence. We look, we're all adults here. We understand independence means they're going to go and annex them next. That's the next step after that. Uh, the invasion will be under the guise of peacekeeping forces. So other than the Ukrainians being able to beat them back, I don't know that there's going to be a strong Western response if it is this limited of an incursion. It's still wrong. It's still a sovereign nation being invaded. But the way they've gone about it and with the way the West is set up, I don't know that there's going to be a lot of strong response here. I think there's going to be a lot of word response, but I don't think there's going to be a lot of actual response. Is that your read on it? Yeah. So at, at the moment, um, they're essentially already marching into land that they proxy control already. So the two breakaway regions of Donetsk and Luhansk, you know, have been independent de facto uh, since, you know, 2014. Um, you, the Ukrainians haven't really had any control over these regions since they broke away and the war started. So if, if Russia is walking into territory which Ukrainians don't control, there's really nothing that can be done unless the Ukrainians want to provoke something uh, and you know, invade these two breakaway republics. Um, and I don't think that's a wise decision. I don't think the West would support such a decision. Um, I think Putin may want that to happen um, because it would give him justification to push further if he wanted to go further. Um, but but if they are only going into into the um, the two breakaway republics, there's absolutely no chance um, that that uh, Western the West is going to do anything more than than um, you know condemn him um, because they're already broken away and it's not changing much by putting troops there. Yeah. Pavel Fitzner, really appreciate your time today on Herd Tell, uh, Young Voices contributor, one of our Aussie friends down there. If you're like me on Twitter or Weird Hours, it's always great talking to our Aussie friends because they're up when we're up at weird times. And he's on the uh, Young Voices page. You can follow him there. We're looking forward to seeing more from him in the future. Pavel Fitzner, appreciate your time, sir. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, sir. Uh, Welcome back to Herd Tell. You know, we pride ourselves on not just driving by stories. We touch back in with them. We update them. Sometimes we'll leave a story alone and come back to it. We've been covering the Ahmaud Aubrey story for quite some time, both in our writing and here on Herd Tell. We talked last week about the ongoing uh, civil rights trial, the hate crimes trial against the three people who have already been convicted for the murder of Ahmaud Aubrey. This was a federal trial and they have been convicted, all three of them on hate crimes and related issues for violating the civil rights of Ahmaud Aubrey, just a small piece from the Washington Post on this. The federal trial, quoting, hinged on proving the defendant's state of mind when they chased and confronted Aubrey. Before Travis McMichael shot him with a shotgun, prosecutors argued that the men's prejudice helped explain why they erroneously viewed the 25-year-old as a potential criminal. The government presented evidence from 20 witnesses, many of whom relayed searing text messages, social media posts, and remarks from the three men in which they expressed hatred and bigotry towards black people. Among the examples, Brian did not want his daughter dating a black man and called him the N-word in several text messages. Gregory McMichael shared a meme that claimed, quote, white Irish slaves were treated worse than any other race in U.S. history, end quote. Travis spoke about killing black people and wrote in a message that he loved his jobs because, quote, zero N-words worked with me, end quote. All three defendants told you loud and clear in their own words how they feel about African-Americans. Assistant U.S. Attorney Tara Lons told the jury made up of eight whites, three blacks, and one Hispanic. We know the story of what happened here. We won't rehash it all. However, there is one part of the story I want to bring back. That's how this became and got to trial in the very first place. Quoting again from the piece, Um, The investigation into the killing was marred by dysfunction from the start. Then Brunswick District Attorney Jackie Johnson recused herself because the elder McMichael had worked as an investigator in her office. She has since been accused of showing favoritism towards Gregory McMichael and directing that his son should not be arrested. In September, she was charged with violating her oath of office in relation to the case. Waycross Judicial Circuit District Attorney George Barnhill, who took over the case, indicated that he viewed Arbery as, quote, a criminal suspect whose shooting was, quote, perfectly legal. Barnhill later stepped aside after it was revealed that his son had worked with the elder McMichaels in Johnson's office. Not until a video of Arbery's killing, which Brian recorded on his cell phone, was made public by a local radio station in May of 2020, 
that prosecutors file murder charges against the three men. Prosecutors did not make race a central focus of the state murder trial in November. We covered that last week. That was good strategy legal-wise. Uh, there was reasons why they did that, but that is also why it was important that they went ahead and did this trial so all this information got out. There's been a lot of debate over hate crimes legislation and things like this. This is a case I think it was warranted. This was clearly a civil rights violation because of the way Georgia law worked. They were not going to be able to get this information into the trial. But I called it this in my writing as well, and I agree with the family. This was a straight-up lynching. This needs to be called what it was, and this information needed to get out. They are now convicted of civil rights violations and hate crimes, and justly so. Again, I'll repeat what I said last week when we talked about this case. I don't know that there's any earthly justice for what happened to Ahmaud Aubrey, but we've done all we can here. But it shouldn't have took going through three different prosecutors, and it shouldn't have took months and it shouldn't have had to take a video going viral to have gotten us here. We still have a long ways to go to really get better at justice in America. More hotel right after this. Ah, welcome back to hotel. You know, we usually try to end the show on an uplifting note or a little bit of a happier note. This is a melancholy note. But it's a story that has a whole lot of meaning, uh, and it's a piece of history that needs to be discussed uh, out of the Washington Post, and we're going to talk about it to end today's program. It's also Black History Month, so it ties into that. Um, From the Washington Post, on August 20th, 1965, Jonathan Daniels stepped outside a county jail in central Alabama the first day free after a week of incarceration for protesting segregation. The white Episcopalian seminarian, he had grown up in a white New England town and graduated from the segregated Virginia Military Institute, was an unlikely civil rights activist. But Daniels had made repeated trips to Alabama to demonstrate alongside African-Americans. Now Daniels and more than a dozen black demonstrators who had all been arrested after protesting the discriminatory way white-owned shops treated black customers craved a cold drink. So they walked the short distance from the sewage plague jail in Haynesville, Alabama, to a convenience store. But when Daniels and one of his black compatriots, a 17-year-old girl named Ruby Sales, approached the front door, a white man clutching a 12-gauge shotgun stood in their way. He said the store's closed, and if you don't get off this blankety-blank property, that's my addition, I'm going to blow your blank heads off. Sales recalled in 1965, according to the documentary, Here I Am, Send Me, the story of Jonathan Daniels. Daniels asked the man, Tom Coleman, a state highway employee who served as a volunteer special deputy sheriff, if he was threatening them, according to Outside Agitator, a biography of Daniels by historian Charles Eagles. Then Daniels pushed Sales out of the way and onto the ground as Coleman opened fire, killing the VMI alumnus instantly. The death of Daniels made national news and turned him into a civil rights hero. He also became an idolized martyr in his alma mater, VMI, the nation's oldest state-supported military college. At the time of Daniel's death, VMI was an all-white, all-male public college that resisted racial integration and whose cadets fought and died for the Confederacy in the Civil War. VMI wouldn't enroll its first black cadets on its Lexington campus until 1968, the last public college in the state, to integrate. In the wake of other scandals, VMI is planning to enhance its commemoration of Daniels. The school already boasts the Daniels Courtyard and Daniels Library, and one of the arches leading into the student barracks is named after him. A plaque in the courtyard bears his image over a quotation from Martin Luther King Jr., quote, one of the most heroic Christian deeds of which I have heard in my entire ministry was that performed by Jonathan Daniels. According to the college's spokesperson, Bill Wyatt, VMI has retained an architectural firm to help design a monument honoring Daniels planned for near the school's entrance. VMI expects to finalize the design and select the exact site for the monument later this year. Quoting Wyatt here, the design will capture the last moments of Daniels life while summoning the viewer to reflect on their personal opportunities for humanitarian services. The school's renewed focus on Daniels comes as it has been grappling with what to do with many of its Confederate contemporaries and commemorations. In December 2020, VMI removed the 108-year-old statue of Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. The school would also scribe Jackson's name from the Barracks Arts. Of course, Stonewall Jackson was teaching at VMI when the Civil War kicked off. Uh, Back to the piece. But VMI 
still has not figured out whether to relocate, keep, or contextualize other tributes and traditions with ties to slavery or the Confederacy. But VMI has always honored Daniels. Over the years, alumni have made pilgrimage to the site of his killing in Haynesville, located between Selma and Montgomery. In the late 90s, the College Board of Visitors voted to establish the Jonathan M. Daniels 61 Humanitarian Award, whose recipients have included President Jimmy Carter and the late U.S. Representative John Lewis of Selma fame, the legendary civil rights activist. In the end of the piece, an interesting tidbit, three years after Daniels was gunned down in Alabama, VMI opened its doors for the first time to five black cadets, Harry Gore, Adam Randolph, Dick Valentine, Phil Wilkerson, and Larry Foster. Valentine, who graduated from VMI in 1972, participated in one of the college's pilgrimages to Haynesville almost four years ago. According to an article at the VMI Alumni Agency's website, the alumni stopped at the county courthouse for a service. Valentine, now the head of the Office of Civil Rights for the Florida Department of Children and Family, addressed the group and said this. Jonathan was placed in a situation where he had to act, and he did. It cost him his life, but we're all the better for it. I don't think that it's a stretch to say that there's a connection between the activities of that day and what took place three years later when VMI let people of color like me to attend the university. So I just want to make a connection that the struggle is real. There's no wrong time to do the right thing. Quite the story of a civil rights icon, leader, and martyr, um, Jonathan Merrick Daniels. He was killed August 20th, 1965 in Alabama on his gravestone. The famous scripture, greater love hath no man than this, than he lay down his life for his friend. By the way, in this piece, the woman he saved, um, Ruby Sales, was quoted saying this. He walked away from the king's table, she said, meaning Daniels. He could have had any benefit he wanted because he was young, white, brilliant, and male, but he did this. A good lesson for everyone. That'll do it for her tell. Uh, thank you so much, whether you're watching on YouTube, listening on any of the podcasting platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google, uh, or one of the aggregating podcast sites. We do see those numbers as well. Uh, if you're listening on any of the Big Talker platforms, uh, the website for Big Talker Network, their Facebook page, we sure do appreciate you. Do us a favor. Make sure you're subscribing wherever you're getting this from. It's very important for a couple of reasons. One is you won't miss anything. Uh, new Herd Tell episodes every weekday. And also the Herd Tell Good Talks come out every afternoon when we do a long form podcast, deep dives into subjects. The latest one we did was on mental health. You'll get those as well. Plus the archive. Uh, we had a funny thing on social media where somebody sent a picture of Herd Tell's past episodes and they've only got 91 of them to go back and listen to. It's kind of amazing. We don't think of it that way, but they're all there. You can listen to them. You can watch them on YouTube. And we're proud to bring them to you. But if you subscribe, you'll never miss a thing and always have access to all of it. Also, all of those platforms, they have a way to leave a rating and a comment. Please do so. It's very important. It let's people know our program is worth the time. We'll also respond to a lot of those comments if we see them. We sure appreciate it. One more thing you can do. Only costs you a couple clicks. Share us on your social media. All those platforms also have a share button. You can share us on your social media. Let people know where to find us that we're doing good quality work and that we are worthy of the most precious thing they have, their time, because you gave us your most precious thing you have, your time. And we never want to waste it. We always want to give you good information to try to discern the times we are living in. And we appreciate it greatly. Anytime you reach out uh, on the email, hertelshow at gmail.com. You can also find us on the Twitter, uh, at hertelshow on the Twitter. We'd love to hear from you. So that'll do it. For today, wherever you and yours are, across the street or around the world, we hope you are well. We hope you are well fed. We'll talk to you again tomorrow for more Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from MonsterCat.com. This is the story of the one. As a maintenance engineer, he hears things differently. To the untrained ear, everything on his shop floor might sound fine, but he can hear gears grinding or a belt slipping. So he steps in to fix the problem at hand before it gets out of hand. And he knows Granger's got the right product he needs to get the job done, which is music to his ears. 
Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. What if you could have a career where the opportunities are as vast as our nation, where it's not about mission statements, but a shared mission? At U.S. Customs and Border Protection, we go beyond to protect more than borders. From ship to shore, air to ground, cities to local communities, CBP agents and officers are keeping people safe. Join U.S. Customs and Border Protection and go beyond for something far greater than yourself. Learn more at cbp.gov careers.